And I also want to thank the Knight Foundation. I mean, I have, have said in the past that, uh, you know, I think when the history is written of this period and we, we uh, un come to understand the convulsive changes that happened in the media landscape and we ask ourselves, how did, how did we try to figure out the solutions to the gaps that were, uh, were created, uh, the Knight Foundation's role is going to be enormous uh, really, the, the amount that they have done in both, uh, not just sticking their fingers in the dike to try to uh, uh, keep things from getting too bad, but being uh, extraordinarily creative and stimulating innovation, including working with the community foundations, is something that I hope that they get uh, the uh, credit that they deserve for. Um, I know I, I, you should, someone should give you a, uh, a, a painting of the, uh, the Dutch boy sticking his finger in the dike, because I know Ibargwen is a Dutch name. Um, <laughs> so I want, first a couple of caveats. This is a, uh, I'm working on a report for the FCC uh, on the future of media. The actual official name of our working group is the Future of Media and the information needs of communities, which is a direct lift from the Knight Commission, and they were kind enough not to sue us for copyright violation. Uh, but it was sometimes nicknamed internally as Son of Knight Commission Report because it was basically very much responding to the challenge that the Knight Commission uh, put forth of we're in the middle of an enormous change. Uh, we cannot assume that it's all evolving magically for the better. Much of it is, but not all of it. Not everyone's needs are being served. Uh, what do we do about it? We're at a, a historic crossroads moment. Um, and so the idea, the chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, asked me to lead a process that would look at what's going on in the media world, figure out what we should be worried about, what we shouldn't be worried about. And then secondly, also look at public policy to see uh, whether the FCC's policies and broadly, more broadly speaking, public policy on communications was in sync with the 21st century. After all, a lot of the rules on the books of the FCC were created before there was an internet. In some cases, they were created before there was a TV set. Uh, so there's a, at least a chance that some of these rules are not quite up to date for the uh, modern communi communications needs. So now, I know because you're here that you are all folks who understand that there's something going on in the media landscape um, that change is, is profound and that some of it is, uh, is worrisome and some of it is exciting. But I want to just review a, a few things first. Um, first, I should say, since the report hasn't come out yet, uh, these are my personal opinions, not yet the official opinions of the report. I reserve the right to completely renounce my own opinions within a few weeks from now and change my mind on everything I've said. Um, in general, I think it's fair to say that actually a lot of the media landscape is fantastic. It's vibrant. There are parts of the media landscape that are more vibrant than they've ever been. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I want, to, I want to at least put that out as a context, even though that's not what I'm going to mostly talk about. But it's important, because government reports, I think there's a natural tendency that it, they have to carry a aura of depression and gloom. And we have plenty of gloom in the report, but I think the honest thing to say is that there's really quite a lot right now that is, uh, is extraordinary and very positive. Uh, so the problems are really not a broad problem with information. It's not a problem with news. I would say it's not even really a problem with journalism. It's really a very specific problem. It's a problem with local, full-time, professional, accountability journalism. That's the nut of where, of where the problem is. And there are other issues, you know, I don't want to say that there are no other problems in the world, in the media world, we all have some, but in terms of their something that is, I think, rises to the level of a real crisis, that's, that's it. But let me, like, let's talk about what that actually means. First, some general statistics. From 2006 to 2009, annual editorial spending at newspapers dropped by $1.6 billion per year. It's about, about a third. Uh, newspaper advertising during that period dropped by 43%. So when people are saying, well, there's a contraction, it's not a 10% contraction or a 
43, a 15% contraction. It's something different. Staffs, newspaper staffs are down by 20%, 25% on average. Often, though, uh, newspaper staffs have been cut in half. They are now, as far as I can tell, to their levels they were at pre-Watergate. Television network news staffs down not 10%, 15%, but half. News magazine correspondent staffs down by half during the same period. Uh, and then if you look outside at other media, uh, the number of all news radio stations is uh, down to 28 cities. It used to be about 50 last time we looked. Uh, the number of local cable news channels uh, is, covers about, about 20, 25% of the population has access to those. So what, is this, what does this actually mean in real terms? So there have been uh, a number of studies that other people have done looking at particular cities. Uh, so for instance, Pew looked at Baltimore and they set, found that when they analyzed stories related to budget, crime, transportation, there were 32% fewer in uh, 2009 than there were in 1999 and 73% fewer than in 1991. Philadelphia. A uh, study run by JLab, who I think uh, Jen Schaefer is here, uh, found that when they compared uh, the news between 2006 and 2009 in Philadelphia, quote, available news about Philadelphia public affairs issues has dramatically diminished over the last three years by many measures, news hall, airtime, story count, keyword measurements. Uh, a professor, James Hamilton, did a study of the Raleigh-Durham area, the Raleigh News and Observer, used to have 250 reporters, now they have about 130. And the interesting thing is the beats that were eliminated. S courts, schools, legal affairs, agriculture, environment, and state education. You probably are familiar with the case of Bell, California, the, uh, the charming city managers who figured out a way of paying themselves $800,000 a year. Now, the LA Times eventually broke this story, but it was six or seven years after this scandal had been developing. So for six or seven years, there was no reporter covering the Bell City Council to see what actually was official acts. This was unusual by corruption standards because it wasn't a behind the scenes you know, thing. They were voting themselves this pay. So by journalistic standards, this actually was an easy story if someone had been there. So that gives you a sense of what kinds of things can happen in communities when, when no, one is, no one is watching. As a, for those of you who might be McKinsey consultants or something like that, uh, when you think about the cost of a $50,000 a year reporter, probably could have saved the citizens of Bell five to six million dollars over that period. But what if you look at it in terms of issues? So you have, uh, one of the things that's talked about a lot is statehouse coverage. So from, uh, 2003 to 2008, spending by state governments went up 50%. Coverage of state governments went down by 33%. Investigative reporting, it's very hard to come up with a, you know, an objective measure of, you know, uh, how much investigative journalism there is, but one, well, a couple of indirect measures, membership in the Investigative Reporters Association, in 2003 was 5,300, now it's 4,000. Submissions to the public service category of the Pulitzer Prizes uh, from 1984 to 2010 dropped 43%. Envir environmental coverage, the Society of Environmental Journalists had 450 newspaper reporters as members in 2004, now they have 244. Reporting on national policy, covering Capitol Hill, things like that. The number of papers with bureaus covering Washington, D.C. has dropped by about a half since the mid-1980s. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation said that health reporting is increased. Uh, health uh, output of news articles has increased, but depth has decreased. They say a loss of in-depth enterprise and policy-related stories. Same thing as reported for education. Uh, religion, my former beat, the head of the Religion News Writers Association, said simply, religion news at the local level is nearly gone. Business reporting is down, et cetera, et cetera. And I think anyone who works in the community actually trying to solve particular problems understands what Luis was talking about before 
of the central role that the information plays in helping you to achieve other goals. It's not a goal unto itself. It is the lubricant um, that enables you to do other, other things. So I was particularly, I mean, we have a lot of examples of this that we've been working on, but I was particularly touched by something that um, a, an expert on family courts in Detroit told us. Uh, he said that the coverage of juvenile courts has gotten smaller and smaller over the years, resulting in, quote, parents whose rights are terminated who shouldn't be terminated. It just takes somebody to go down there to get the story, but nobody is ever down there. Uh, now, we also, we, we focus like everyone else and all other reports that have done this. We do, you look a lot at newspapers because newspapers tended to provide the bulk of the reporting of this kind of material over the years. But in fact, uh, they're only one part of the food chain. And the number one source of news is actually the local TV station. So we spent a lot of time looking at local TV news. There actually is some exciting stuff going on local TV news. The number of hours that local TV news is, is producing has gone up. Um, there are certainly many great local newscasts, and they really excel, uh, especially during times of emergency. They're making better use of, uh, of citizen reporting to help with that. But by and large, they are not uh, putting the kind of boots to the ground to fill in the gaps uh, of the newspapers. So I do, at least as of this moment, the local TV is not going to um, fill that gap. Um, now, these are the traditional media, right? So you might say, well, OK, this is like complaining about the gaps in traditional media is like uh, you know, the complaining about the plight of the buggy whip makers when the cars were coming in. If something really great is going to replace them, who cares? Yeah, it'll be a rough couple of years and journalists will have to find other professions or get retrained, but from a health of democracy perspective, it doesn't really matter whether newspapers are here or not. What matters is whether the function that newspapers were performing uh, were doing that. So, um, the internet in general, you know, I think has improved accountability. Uh, it has improved information flow in, in almost limitless numbers of ways. And it's even improved journalism in a lot of ways. I think initially a lot of traditional media people were very dismissive about new media. And it was the classic, you know, these are a bunch of people in their pajamas sitting home spewing opinions without doing any actual reporting. And that's really was always an unfair rap. And I think the traditional media now has kind of come to understand that, particularly as they've started to use the new media more themselves. So the technology has reduced the costs of producing journalism in many cases. The lower barriers to entry um, means that there can be more diversity of voices than there were in the traditional media, more consumer choices. Citizens have more power to choose the content that they want, to share it, contribute it, and help to create and do the journalism themselves. The idea that everyone is a publisher has opened the eyes, uh, opened the way for a new commentariat, uh, which I think is actually in many ways more meritocratic than the old op-ed pages. And in, you know, and you don't have. You can look around the world and see governments toppling to understand that these new media have uh, important accountability functions. Uh, I think, for instance, you know, here I think it's fair to say that hyper local, meaning information on the local, the neighborhood level, is probably better than it's ever been, because you have tools that enable people to share information on a very um, neighborhood block by block level. And no, they don't have business models, but they don't need to, because in many ways these are civic functions. These are volunteer efforts. It's a, th a thousand points of journalism, um, and it's having really very positive effects. So it's really more at this kind of municipal and state level that we're seeing problems. But what about the other ways that the internet interacts? I, I would say that the, the, as of now, uh, the internet has not filled the gap. Um, and one really key thing to understand is the difference between there being an increase in the number of voices, an increase in the number of outlets, an increase in the distribution mechanisms, and a decrease in journalism at the same time. 
This is, I think, probably the most important concept for us to grasp because we live in a world and you sort of think, well, how could there be a media problem where a wash in choices? There's media everywhere. We have more, more ways of consuming news, more ways of consuming information than we've ever had before. How could there be a problem? And yet there is. You have these, this thing where you simultaneously in a particular community can have more news and less journalism at the same time. So Pew, for example, did a study of, uh, when they did their study of Baltimore, they found 53 different news outlets. Uh, that's more than you would have found 10 years ago. But then they did a content analysis and they said, well, 95% of the, uh, of the news actually came from the Baltimore Sun and uh, one or two of the TV stations. So it's actually was still the, low, the traditional media that was creating the news that was then repurposed by the new media. And, and the traditional media is doing less. And there were a number of different studies that have kind of come to the same conclusion. So you might, it's very, very tempting, and it may even be true that, well, okay, that's a problem right now, but the internet is solving problems so fast that something will come along, you know, by the end of today and, and fix this. And it could be. I should have that huge caveat that it could be. It's a really terrifying thing about writing a year-long government report. Uh, the odds that uh, what you think even a month before you're done is still true by the time you're done is, is low. Um, but here are a couple, a couple possible reasons why this may not get solved the way we've seen the internet solve some other issues. A lot of the problems that have developed with the traditional media business models have happened because markets have become more efficient, not less. So when you think about the traditional newspaper model, to oversimplify it, there was a bundle to it. And you would pay for the bundle, and you might only care about getting box scores, but your quarter or whatever you were paying for was also paying to help for the, pay for the City Hall reporter. Uh, you know, Ann Landers was funding the Baghdad Bureau, and Horoscopes was funding the State House reporter, and that was the way that the bundle worked, and we were never really aware of it because we were get, it was all one bundle, and it was really cheap, because advertisers were subsidizing it, so it was like an incredible deal. We didn't mind that we were funding reporting that we might not actually read. Now the bundle is broken apart. We can now go to a sports site to get our box scores, and in fact, it's better, like they actually update it every three seconds. Now I pick up a box score in a print newspaper, and I keep staring at it, waiting for it to change, <laughs> and it doesn't. Um, so the bundle is broken, and now we are, the, the, uh, we are laid bare with the uh, actually having to choose the content that uh, if we want civically important content, we have to choose and pay for it. The same thing has happened with advertising has become unbundled. It used to be advertisers didn't know whether their money was going to something effective, and now they do. Uh, and these co combined have put this tremendous downward pressure on ad rates. Um, and I think this is probably why Chris uh, Hughes was saying that he didn't, wasn't optimistic about it. Um, from, it's a bit of myth that newspaper, newspapers get a little bit of a bum rap that they had their head in the sand and they didn't try to go online. They, they were trying from 2005 to 2009, newspaper um, page views online went from 1.6 billion to 3 billion. That's not bad. During that period, their online advertising grew $716 million as a result of that traffic growth, which sound impressive, $716 million, until you hear that during the same period, their print revenue dropped by $22 billion. This led to the saying that print dollars were being replaced by digital dimes, and it really was more like digital pennies. Uh, I had this experience in the website I used to run. One of the advantages of running a website is you can give yourself a blog and a column and people don't object. And I got, uh, and I, at this moment where I got my blog up to 100,000 page views, I thought like, this is great, 100,000 page views is like, that sounds like a, a lot of traffic. And you know, maybe I could give up this job and just become a, a blogger and make a living like that until we did the numbers and it turned out that I was earning for the entire company $756 uh, for the month for that 100,000 page views. That gives you a sense of how hard it is to create business models based on advertising, and it's really why um, you know, there's so much effort looking at iPads and ways of charging 
for things because the ad model really is tough. Uh, the, uh, one of the most exciting things that's happened is um, the proliferation of new local news websites. But here again, uh, the numbers are just not all that encouraging, though the, the, the quality of the work is extraordinary and the energy is extraordinary. Um, the business models are still struggling. There's a, a study that's uh, looked at 66 local news websites and they said that half of them reported annual incomes of less than 50,000. That's annual incomes for the entire entity of less than 50,000. Three quarters had a, less than 100,000. So these are not the entities that are gonna be, uh, at least in their current form, replacing the tens of thousands of newspaper reporters that have gone away. Um, now, there, there are experiments like Patch and Examiner.com that are trying to fill some of these, um, and they're going to fill some of the purposes, but by their own reckoning, they are not set up to do uh, long-form, in-depth journalism. In fact, Huffington Post, because they did care about doing long-form journalism, set up a foundation to do it because they were so convinced that it wouldn't fit within their main business model to, uh, to do it that way. Um, now, I think that, uh, as you may have been following with Washington, this is not likely to be a period where the federal government is going to uh, rise up and spend billions of dollars to help local journalists. Um, that's not going to happen. So we have this contraction in the newspaper sector. We have a contraction in TV. We have difficulty of the, the, internet, the commercial internet sector in getting traction on this. And the government's not going to step in to fund this. Um, you know, even the programs that already exist, like the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, are fighting for their life right now. Um, so what's going to happen? It, what this seems to point to is that there's going to need to be a bigger role for, for nonprofit media broadly defined. Now, when I say nonprofit media, I, uh, I use that term carefully because it's not just public TV and public radio, though they are linchpins. It is also nonprofit websites. It is community media centers, public access channels, PEG channels, state public affairs networks, state C-SPANs, some states have. Uh, it is low power FM stations. It is journalism schools that are themselves running uh, local news operations. Um, and it is these entities working with each other and increasingly working with the commercial sector. You're seeing some really interesting partnerships develop uh, between the commercial sector and the nonprofit sector, uh, where you will have, uh, for instance, uh, we became familiar with uh, uh, through the FCC's work on the Comcast-NBC uh, merger, um, NBC, uh, the NBC affiliate or station in San Diego had a great partnership with Voice of San Diego, which is one of the best of the local news websites. And it was a fantastic partnership because they would come on a couple times a week, do San Diego fact check and some other uh, more in-depth things. It website got an enormous amount of... Um, uh, extra traffic and exposure, and uh, it was a really fantastic uh, for both of them. So you can start to see the beginnings of a model where, in effect, the commercial sector is outsourcing broccoli journalism to the nonprofit sector. And I think that actually is not a crazy concept, and it's not something to be over that depressed about. I think that can work, but it requires a basic minimum level of support on the nonprofit sector side. Um, now the pressure should start to feel, you should start to feel burdens coming onto your shoulders uh, as, as, I, as I go into this because, um, as I think I said, the government is not going to hit this. The commercial sector, I think, will improve, but it's not going to fill it back to where it was. Uh, so the nonprofit sector is going to have to rise up. Um, traditionally, helping fill this business model gap in journalism was not something foundations would have had any reason to do. This was a big business, a lucrative business. Having a foundation give money to a newspaper, you know, to, that was owned by Gannett or Rupert Murdoch or something like that would be not the best use of a foundation's money. Um, 
that has changed. And we are now in this period where the things that used to be well supported by the commercial sector are now uh, areas that the nonprofit sector, including foundations, uh, have to play a really essential role. And when you combine that with the fact, as I said before, that when you look at the problems in the media sector, the problems are not mostly national, they're local. The, the, the burdens should feel even heavier on, on your shoulders, that the community foundations really need to play a key role in this. Uh, I, frankly, I'm actually not sure who will if the community foundations don't. I think, I think community foundations are that central to solving this problem. Um, and, and, I, and I also think that it, to, to put an even finer point on it, I noticed in the very interesting survey that uh, Knight did of what foundations are already doing, and it sounds like there's been a tremendous level of activity and excitement and interest in this, which is very gratifying. Um, that it's a mix of public education things, of raising issues about uh, certain topics, raising issues about media, but that a relatively small percentage of it or a minority of it is actually going to fund journalism itself. So I would, my two cents, unofficial, my personal opinion, not the FCC's, uh, is that um, it's, it's really important to be looking at how foundations can actually directly help with the business model problem of journalism, which has to do with really figuring out ways of funding the journalism. Um, now, I, I, I want to end on a, on a more optimistic note, which is that, <laughs> um, as I said at the outset, even though we didn't spend as much time on it, you know, it is really an incredible time in the media system, and if you were to, uh, you know, look at the whole range of media, hyperlocal, national, international, all the different ways that this happens, things are really either better than ever or very dynamic and will probably work themselves out. I think if you took a newspaper uh, and you created two piles and started to tear the sheets out and created one pile of things the new system is doing as well or better and things that the new system is not doing well, this pile is much bigger than this pile. It's a relatively small number of things that the new media system is not grappling with. It just happens to be the part that the Founding Fathers had in mind <laughs> when they talked about the fourth estate as being as important a function of democracy as the other branches of government. So it's, it's manageable in size in terms of dollars and bodies, but absolutely crucial. So that's, that's a good combination. And if, you, if we as a society are able to figure out a way of solving this one nut, we actually will end up with the best media system that we have ever had. Because when you combine the, uh, the, all of the ways that the new media systems enables for participation by members of the community, combine that with some of the nuts and bolts stuff that you have to have bodies, boots on the ground as they say, to do, they magnify each other's power tremendously. Community journalism works better when there's a full-time reporter. Full-time reporting works better when there's an active community. We could end up with a system that is the best we've ever had. So I don't want you to think that you know, you're, you're looking at this abyss and you're, you know, you're trying to uh, stop this disaster from happening. That's true. But it's better than that. It's you're trying, to, you're trying to convert a situation where that could be disastrous, but has the potential to be something fantastic, something very exciting. And so I feel like you're at the center of you know, a very, very exciting, important task. Um, and I uh, thank you for working on that. Obviously, the fact that you are all here shows that you uh, get that there's something that needs attention here and so mostly I want to reinforce your, uh, your initial instinct that this is important and say uh, it's crucially important and to uh, keep up the good work and let us know if there's any way we can help. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Grio? Grio, which is an African American media property uh, that NBC owns, has launched, right? Um, and so the question was about what advice for folks who are trying to do this, getting a little resistance perhaps internally. Um, and, and it is hard, you know, it's the, the part of the problem for folks like you, and I experienced this firsthand for 10 years, is everything is very measurable now, right? So I, before there were metrics, when I was at Newsweek, uh, I could convince, I could attempt to convince my editor that some story on, I don't know, what's trying to think of a story I did that I knew no one was reading. Um, <laughs> it describes a lot of what I did. Um, I, I could convince them that, uh, you know, really there's a lot of people who are reading this story and they'd have no way of disproving it. Now they can disprove it in 10 seconds. And you see down to uh, the most depressing level of detail, like, oh, they read this story, but they didn't click on the second page, uh, kind of detail, just how well it's doing. And that leads to a whole dynamic being unleashed, which is every piece of content now has an ROI. Every piece of content has a budget. And your, each piece of content has to be profitable, or at least that's often the way it happens. And if you're looking at the whole balance sheet the way I used to do, it's absolutely inevitable. You'll get to that day when you, get, you look at the things, bottom five things are unprofitable. Well, if you're a business, don't do them anymore, right? That's what you do. You knock off the unprofitable parts. And the problem is that a lot of the civically important stuff is not necessarily the thing that gets the absolute most page views. This was an issue that was concealed in the old days by the newspaper bundle. It always was probably there, like there always were more people reading the horoscopes than reading the story about City Hall. We just didn't know. So we could kid ourselves that our stuff was just as popular. Now we all know. So uh, this, I, I know I have to come up with some happy ending to this story. I think that, um, I, I really do think that part of the, part of the key is gonna be uh, a, a whole new way of thinking about partnerships between the commercial and nonprofit sectors. This is really an anathema to most commercial entities who view the nonprofit sector. It was just different. These are different worlds, different cultures. Maybe they're not, you know, both sides think the other one's quality is inferior. Um, and, you know, there's some real cultural gaps that need to be broken down. Uh, I would love to think that the commercial media is going to come up with a really profitable model and obviously the holy grail, the thing everyone's waiting to see is the iPad. Is that going to change the dynamic, get people to pay for things? But I think there's a decent chance it won't and that you're going to have to come up with these other ways of filling the gaps and that partnerships between the commercial sector and nonprofit sector are going to be one of them. I'm looking for a happy ending too. Uh, I'm Bill Mall from San Antonio, the Area Foundation, and I also run the public television station in San Antonio. We're uh, not only anticipating possible loss of federal funding, but I'd look for your comment on the future of Spectrum. Uh, we're facing uh, the loss of Spectrum to fuel the need for broadband. And if you look out five or ten years, will we have any Spectrum left for commercial or non-commercial broadcast use? The, uh, the chairman of the FCC has proposed, and President Obama has proposed, a voluntary spectrum auction system. And the reason they've proposed this, for those of you who are not steeped in spectrum policy, um, is that there is a spectrum crunch looming 
uh, that makes it hard for there to be enough wireless broadband capacity. So when you start off with the goal, as uh, the president did, of having 98% of the population be connected, it's very hard to do that unless you have more wireless spectrum. Broadcasters have a lot of spectrum. Um, and so they came up with this idea for a voluntary system where a typical TV station may actually have four channels now because when they had the digital transition, they went from one channel to four. And they basically, so the offer is going to be something like, if you want to use two of those instead of four, you can take two of your channels, put the spectrum up for auction, and you are going to get some of that money. And, you know, this is for commercial broadcasters as nonprofit as well as nonprofit broadcasters. It's a voluntary system. So the short answer is anyone who wants to have spectrum is going to have spectrum. The hope is that there are going to be enough stations that look at this and think, hey, this is actually a pretty good deal. We can continue to do, you know, a, a air broadcast on two channels. We, you know, five years ago we only had one, so it's not the worst thing in the world to have two. And we have cable access, you know, for 98%, 95% of our audience. So we'll take these other two channels and we're going to get a, a windfall um, that can help finance our operations or wh whatever you want to use it for. And then that part of the money would go to the de deficit reduction. I think the way they're thinking about it is part of the money would go to the 